very pleased to have today with us Koki Roberts, who is a reporter on National Public Radio and as a, as a regular news analyst on ABC News. A graduate of Wellesley's, Wellesley College, where she received a bachelor's degree in political science. She's married to Steve Roberts, a professor and fellow journalist. They have two children, six grandchildren. Do I have the count right? Good. Six grandchildren. Uh, their daughter, Rebecca, is also a reporter. <coughs> She is, and this is the most important part, a resident of Pauly's Island. <laughs> Don't believe what Wikipedia says or anybody else, but she's from Georgetown County, one of our own. Koki, welcome to Tootsie's With. Thank you very much. So I was going to say, with this young adult hugging over there, my head, picture of fake news. <laughs> Can't get away with that. Um, but what a treat it is to be here with all of you in this beautiful, beautiful library. Isn't it fabulous? It really is. Um, and um, and uh, the Waccamaw Library, um, which is new, uh, relatively just few last few years, is also just a spectacular place. Um, I love going in there because it's always full of kids. And uh, that, that makes me feel like we're doing the right thing in Georgetown County. We need to do more of the right thing, but we're doing the right thing. I want to talk for just one second about libraries before I talk on the theme of the day, because I think it's so important. Um, there, was a, there was a story yesterday and um, the, the Aspen Institute sends out every day at noon five great ideas. And one was libraries are saving America. And uh, because there is space where we actually come together, which doesn't happen much these days, and, um, and where people uh, can work together side by side, learn together, uh, be amused together, um, and um, also they're terribly important for new members of our communities uh, to come in, get to know the community, particularly if they don't speak English, um, and the heroes who are the librarians back there uh, really do incredible community service. Uh, and every, every year the, the demands are greater. Um, write a res help me write a resume, help me work a computer, help me do all of these things. And the resources are fewer. Uh, and that's why the friends are so incredibly important and so I'm, one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be here. There is some good news. Um, last year, the New York Public Library had 17 million visitors, more than all the museums in New York and all the sports events in New York combined. So, and we're seeing that around the country. Uh, libraries are really an important part of our communities and people understand that. Um, Pew uh, Research, which is the gold standard of, of polls, by the way, should you care to know, um, uh, did a, a survey in 2016. 66% of the people said closing the library would have a major community impact, negative community impact. 69% said libraries contributed a lot to the community. 58% uh, libraries are good at educating, uh, at providing educational opportunities for people of all ages. And then here's some, some numbers that surprised me. 53% of millennials, who we think of not being able to read, um, <laughs> certainly not being able to be polite, but uh, have, have said that they visited a bookmobile in the last 12 months. Um, yes, and 45% of Gen Xers, 43% of baby boomers, and 36% of those of us in the silent generation. I've never <laughs> felt all that silent myself. but um, with, so it's, it's recognized by our populace that these are important institutions. And here in Georgetown County, that is really true. Um, so that's why I'm here. It's a, it's a treat to be here and to be with all of you. And I do love talking about women in history. That is true. Um, I got into it because I cover uh, politics in Congress, of course, and if you cover it as, as much as I have, I mean, as my, one of my colleagues says, you cover it like a cheap suit. Um, but, um, the, uh, 
you have to go back all the time and read what the founding fathers said about various things. So, you know, the right to bear arms, the place of religion in the public square, why you have to be born in America to be president, all those kinds of things come up, you know, all the time in modern uh, debate. And the founders are cited always, almost 100% almost inaccurately. And, um, and so I, you know, was always going back and reading what they had actually said about each of these things and gotten to know them quite well, sort of on a first name basis. And, um, and then I started wondering, well, what about the women of the era? Uh, because I had always, again, I'd written a lot about women in politics, women as, as politicians, women as voters. Uh, I had also grown up in a political family uh, where I saw the tremendous influence of women of my mother's generation, um, where they, they really ran everything. They ran their husbands' campaigns, they ran the voter registration drives, they basically ran the political conventions. In Washington, working with the African-American women in Washington, they ran all the social service agencies before there was home rule. And so um, they, I'd seen their tremendous influence, and I thought, well, from this period, at the beginning of the country, this crucial period, what were the women up to? And uh, all I knew was Martha Washington at Valley Forge, and Dolly Madison saving George Washington's portrait, and Betsy Ross making the flag, which was debunked, but I think she actually did it. I found something <laughs> contemporaneous. Um, but, um, so I, I went back to find out about them and discovered I couldn't uh, because there was so little written. Uh, with the exception of a couple of good Abigail Adams biographies, there was really nothing. And uh, that's changed, I'm happy to say, since I started this work. There have been a, a couple of good Dolly Madison biographies and a better Martha Washington one. Not great, but better. Um, and. Um, so I, I realized if I really wanted to learn about them, I had to do the work myself. And it is detective work to write about um, women in the 18th century because nobody thought that it was important to save what they did. There were some great exceptions, thank the Lord, and one was South Carolina's own Eliza Pinckney. And you think about Eliza Pinckney. I mean, honest to God, she's comes here with her mother, who one of one of the Pinckney descendants in Charleston tells me, I think her mother was a drug addict. Okay then, uh, you know, but Loudenham. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, handing out stuff for pain. And um, so she comes with her mother and her baby sister, and, uh, and this is the early 18th century, not exactly sure of the year, but, um, well before the revolution, and um, her father leaves her here in charge of two plantations, and she's 16 years old. I mean, we don't leave our 16-year-olds in charge of a car. Uh, and, um, and fortunately, because she had to keep him apprised of, of the business, she wrote and kept copies in her letter book. So we really do know a lot about her life. And, um, and it's quite a life. I mean, not only was she running these plantations, but she always had new schemes, and she referred to them as my little schemes. And so she planted a bunch of mulberry bushes to, get to create silk. And she uh, broke the law and taught the enslaved people on her plantations uh, to read and write. She also did a certain amount of lawyering and she said, if an actual lawyer's around, I'll let him do the work. But you know, there aren't many around. And, uh, and her father kept trying to marry her off, and she kept refusing, which was quite remarkable for a girl in, in that point in time. Um, and she, um, she was an avid reader. And, and to show you that times don't change much, one of the old biddies in the neighborhood told her that she'd never catch a man. Um, because she was such a reader, and the woman threatened to throw her copy of Plutarch's Lives into the fire. Um, but she soldiered on, and of course her main contribution that you know about is the planting of indigo, uh, which she 
uh, tried and failed and tried and failed and was sabotaged by her uh, foreman because they didn't want a girl succeeding. Um, but she finally tried and succeeded and introduced the planting of indigo into the Carolinas. And again, a contemporaneous historian said that it was more important to the wealth of the Carolinas than all of the silver of Mexico was to Mexico. And the reason for that, if you, if you don't know, is that because the British basically subsidized it uh, because it was used for the dye of all the military uniforms. So they needed indigo. And she did it. And she did it by the time she was 19. <coughs> she was still a teenager. She, um, all six of my grandchildren are now teenagers, so I'm keen on this. Um, but, <coughs> But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but she, uh, she, the, this marriage issue was a problem. And, um, and she was quite friendly with, uh, with Pinckney. And uh, she was Lucas. She was quite friendly with Pinckney. And uh, his wife had the nice grace to die. And, uh, and just as her father was really ready to hie her off back to Antigua. And so um, she married Pinckney and um, had three children, uh, three living children, Charles Coatsworth, Thomas, and uh, Harriet Ori, and, um, and lived a very dedicated patriotic life that is really, again, wonderfully documented, um, mainly by her descendants. And uh, when she died, she'd gone to Philadelphia to be treated for breast cancer. So the things that don't change, good and bad. And um, she died in Philadelphia. And George Washington, by this time, was president. And he insisted, he insisted, on being a pallbearer at her funeral because of the contributions she had made to the formation of the United States of America. So I was thrilled to meet Eliza. Um, but I was still working on the the women who were <clears throat> very influential in the lives of the founding fathers. And um, I did discover that Martha Washington was a very interesting person. And it wasn't just that one freezing winter at Valley Forge. Uh, she went with the Continental Army to camp every winter of the Revolution. And, um, and it was uh, difficult. It was dangerous. Uh, the roads were terrible, all of that, but also she was a prime target for hostage taking, uh, which happened to some of the Patriot wives. One was, in fact, tortured and killed. And she, there she was, the wife of the commander of the army, so she was really uh, in danger. And then you get to camp, and that was no fun. I mean, it was cold and unpleasant and all of that. But she uh, and the other officers' wives would cook for the uh, soldiers, pray with the soldiers, nurse the soldiers, put on entertainments for them uh, to keep morale up because Washington felt strongly that uh, the army would desert by regiment. Uh, no bread, no soldier was the saying. Uh, so he desperately needed her there um, to, to keep the army together. And it was a good thing she hung around because uh, George could be indiscreet. Um, there was one dance where he danced for three hours straight with the very pretty and flirty, thank you, Catherine Littlefield Green, Nathaniel Green's wife. Um, so it was good Martha was on hand. And um, <laughs> she also had a very good sense of humor. She named it Tomcat Hamilton, <laughs> which was completely appropriate. Um, but it turns out that the winner of Valley Forge uh, the person that we need to be grateful to is not any of the Patriot wives uh, who were starving and freezing along with our army out in Valley Forge. At any moment, the British who were occupying Philadelphia at the time could have marched out and just decimated the Continental Army. But they were having way too good a time in Philadelphia uh, with the loyalist women. And uh, one in particular we have to be grateful to, Betsy Loring, who was occupying Sir William Howe and uh, keeping him from, you know, commanding an army. And uh, everybody knew about it. The newspapers at the time published little ditties, you know. Sir William, he snug as a flea, lay all the time a snoring, nor dreamed of harm as he lay warm in bed with Mrs. Loring. Um, 
So I would like to say she did this out of patriotic uh, sentiments. No. Um, she got a good job for her husband in the British Army, and maybe she likes her William, I don't know. But, uh, but there were so many fabulous patriots, and, um, and they really uh, were remarkable when you think about it. Just getting through the day in the 18th century was hard, right? You know, there was, there was no, nothing to help you um, in terms of appliances, etc. And, uh, and then to care so much about the fate of the country, uh, having lived through a very difficult day, uh, to sit down at the end of a day and take pen to paper, quill to paper, uh, quill to parchment, and, and write it about it is, to me, incredible. Uh, and Abigail Adams did it day after day after day. And um, at one point, she was at home in Massachusetts, and you know, John is off at the Continental Congress. Nobody's paying him to be at the Continental Congress. So she's trying to, you know, eke out an existence. She's got four little kids. The, Brit the Americans are quartering at her tiny house, much smaller than this room. Um, and, uh, and oh, by the way, the British are coming. And uh, at one point, John writes to her from Philadelphia and says, if it gets really dangerous, take our children and fly to the woods. And, you know, thank you, John. Uh, you know, having a nice dinner in Philadelphia, are you? You know, so, uh, but she was, she was incredible in her devotion to the country and was furious with the men in Philadelphia that they were not declaring independence sooner. She kept saying, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And um, I mean, she thought they were just lily livered. And, um, and she said at one point, you know, we women are really better patriots than you men because we are suffering all the hardships and making all the sacrifices for the cause. And if we win, of course, if we lost, the men would be hanged, which gets your attention. But, um, but if we win, she said, you will be held in high esteem. You will hold office, and we won't even be able to vote. So you, we're better patriots than you are. And John pretty much agreed with her. Um, he didn't pay her any attention when she did write her, fam her most famous words, when she said to him, I hope you're going to declare an independency. And as I think about the new form of government which you will have to create, I hope that you will remember the ladies. And um, all men would be tyrants if they could. And he just laughed at it and said, petticoat government, I fear more than anything else, which is you know, classic put down. Uh, but, um, but she um, stayed incredibly true to the cause. and. Um, and showed the patriotic spirit. And you see that in person after person. Again, back here, uh, Rebecca Mott. Unbelievable. So, you know, the British have occupied her house, Fort Mott, and uh, her husband's dead. Her son-in-law, Thomas Pinckney, is, is held captive. And um, the Americans come through, General Lee and General uh, Marion and say to her, Mrs. Mott, we're really sorry uh, because you've already made so many sacrifices, but we need to burn down your house. And, uh, and she says, because we need to smoke out the British, capture them so we can get on to Charleston. And she says, no problem. Uh, in fact, I have the perfect weapon for you to burn down my house. I have these trick arrows that someone gave my husband, and on, on impact, they burst into flame. So she gives him the arrows, and one of the things I love is one of the descendants wrote, and the case for the arrows has been handed down in the family as a case for knitting needles. You know, it's just so fabulously practical, and swords into plowshares and all that, but, um, but so uh, it all happens, it works. You know, they, they shoot the arrows, the house bursts into flames, although it didn't burn to the ground. Uh, the British come out, they're captured, and then they all sit down to dinner together. The American generals, the British generals, and Mrs. Mott, who was probably serving them. And, um, and General Lee writes in his memoir, you know, the demeanor the, of Mrs. Mott gave no indication of the hardship she had just suffered because she was so charming and, and affable. 
so, you know, you have all of these incredible stories that just come one after another. And uh, as I've sort of kept going through history, I've realized that it is so much more fun to write about women in history than it is to write about men. First of all, their letters are about 1,000% better than men's letters. I mean, they're just so, so, so much better. Because the men understood, particularly in the founding period, but all through our history, that what they, if they were an important man, uh, that their letters would be preserved and published. And, um, and so they wrote with that in mind. And so their letters are very studied and edited and pompous. And um, the women just wrote letters. They didn't expect me to be reading their mail 200 years later. And, um, and they're far more descriptive of American life uh, because they, they do talk politics. They talk politics a lot and uh, very uh, ardently. But they also talk about the economics of the time. They talk about the fashions. Uh, they talk about who is having and all too often losing babies. Um, they talk about their in-laws, uh, everybody. And so you get a much, much fuller picture of what's going on in America. And also, they talk about the men. And uh, we see these men as kind of bronze and marble deities. Their wives didn't see them that way. Uh, they were aware of their human um, frailties. Uh, and you know, I find that so much more admirable. It's easy for a deity to do something hard and remarkable, like founding this country. But uh, for a man, it's not that easy. And you get a much more complete sense of, of their difficulties and their embarrassments and their struggles um, through the women's letters and their letters to the women, uh, which are much franker than their letters to the men. I mean, who but to his wife would John Marshall have written when he was riding the circuit in North Carolina that he had arrived and discovered that he had no britches. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, I tried to find a tailor. And Raleigh was really a one-horse town at this point. And he says, I tried to find a tailor, but none was available. So I shall have to spend the whole term without that important article of clothing. <laughs> and I can't look at his portraits. I mean, I... <laughs> avert my gaze because, um, I mean, what was he wearing uh, under those robes? But um, so you do get a different picture. Uh, I would also argue that history that does not talk about um, half of the human race is inaccurate history. It's not just that it's not as interesting and not as filled, as, as, as filled in, it's not accurate. You can't just talk about half of the human race and have a, a history that tells the whole story. And, um, and as I say, it is so much more fun to have this part of the story uh, because uh, it is uh, much more complete. Um, among the many letters that I, and most of these letters have never been published. Uh, I really, you know, as I say, it's detective work. But one that I came upon that just utterly first amazed and then delighted me uh, was a letter that Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife, wrote uh, when he was Secretary of State. And <clears throat> she would write these chatty letters home to her father-in-law, John Adams, uh, because Abigail had died and she wanted to amuse him. And so she would write these sort of gossipy, interesting letters home to him. And uh, in 1820, with the first Missouri Compromise, first of all, John Adams was running for president. I mean, John Quincy Adams. But it's unseemly to actually run for president. So you have to make it clear you want to be president and try to convince people to vote for you without running for president. And um, so she did that. She said it was her vocation to get him elected president. And she wined and dined all the members of Congress who eventually did elect John Quincy Adams president. But she, um, she, the year of 1820, uh, 
Congress stayed in, in session much longer than usual because they had to hammer out the Missouri Compromise, the first Missouri Compromise, and so it took a long time. Finally, they go home. It's summertime. They've never stayed that long. It was, it was a disaster because they were running out of ice, people were getting sick, all that. And um, finally, they go home. She goes in June to a meeting of the trustees of the Orphan Asylum, which Dolly Madison had helped set up after the British invasion. And um, she gets there, and one of the other trustees says to her, we're going to need a new building. And she says, why? Why are we going to need a new building? What's happened? They said, well, the session had been very long. And she writes with underlining, and the fathers of the country had left 47 cases to be provided for, and our institution is likely to have to do that. They had left behind 47 pregnant women. And yes, now some of them might have been recidivists, I don't know, but, um, but they were only like 180 members of Congress. And, um, and so the, she, says, she says, so I propose that the great and moral body should take the $2 additional in pay that they have voted for themselves daily and use it for the construction of an orphanage for their progeny. Uh, this was just so fabulous. We knew you never read that in a man's letter. <laughs> no, it was just great. Um, uh, her, her daughter-in-law, Abigail Brooks Adams, was also, all these Adams wives were fabulous letter writers, and she, um, she briefly was in Washington when her husband, Charles Francis Adams, was in Congress right before the Civil War. And he then went off to London to become the Union's ambassador to the court of St. James and actually kept the British from recognizing the Confederacy. Uh, and she, while she was briefly in Washington, wrote these wonderful letters home to her son, Henry Adams, awful person, uh, and, she, um, and she said, Things like, you know, President Buchanan is a silly old toad, and um, uh, the Senate behaves like children and silly ones at that. <laughs> I mean, I can get behind it, you know. And, um, but my, my favorite was she said, I would advise any young woman who wants to have a quiet, peaceful life not to marry an Adams. Um, <laughs> But in that period, uh, my favorite letter writer is uh, Verena Davis. Uh, she is just an absolutely delightful, interesting person. Jefferson Davis, awful, awful man. But horrible to her. Uh, really uh, not a person of principle. But she was just terrific. And she hated Stephen Douglas. Um, a lot of Washington hated Stephen Douglas. He, of course, the senator from Oak, uh, Illinois who defeated Lincoln for Senate in the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. And after Dolly Madison died in 1849, there was a tremendous rivalry in Washington among all of the uh, political wives of who was going to be the bell, the chief bell. And they described themselves as bells. Um, one of the Virginia Clay Clopton, who was the wife of the senator from Alabama, wrote a book about herself called A Bell of the 50s. Um, and the one person who they all kind of agreed was the most special of them all was Adele Cutts. And it's remarkable that they had this view because she really did not have a husband who was prominent. Uh, she was Dolly Madison's great niece, which helped. Uh, and uh, her uncle had been in Congress, but she was not uh, well connected. And uh, in the lead up to the Civil War, she married Stephen Douglas. And Verena Davis was furious. And she wrote to her mother and said, you know, this is awful. He's, he's, He's a drunk, and with his first wife's money, he marries a well-bred, beautiful woman because she is poor and her father is proud. And then she adds, Verena adds, it's a good thing there's a new water system coming to Washington. She says, because maybe Douglas will wash a little oftener. She says, 
if he don't, she says, his acquaintances will have to build bigger rooms with better ventilation. <laughs> no, you don't learn from the men's letters that Stephen Douglas stinks. You know? I mean, that's something you can only learn from the women. Um, and uh, and she, she was, she did write constantly fascinating letters um, after the war, <clears throat> after they were captured and Davis sent to prison and then finally he's out because she goes and constantly nags Andrew Johnson and um, and he they go off to England he comes back moves to Mississippi with a woman um, who, she eventually comes back uh, moves with him helps him with his memoir and he finally dies thank God <laughs> He died on the street I lived on in New Orleans. And actually, when I was a little girl, it's still there. There's a sort of monument in, in New Orleans um, to him that looks like a gravestone. And so when we were children, we kind of tiptoe past because we thought the ghost was there. But, um, but at any rate, she is now free. She's poor, but she's free. And she takes a job in New York uh, working for the New York world. And uh, it is a scandal. The first lady of the Confederacy is going to New York City. Okay. Now, she had never been fully accepted by the Confederacy in the same way that Mary Lincoln had never been accepted by the Union. And um, part of the reason was that her grandfather had been governor of New Jersey, and she had gone to school in the North. And she was somewhat uh, darker complected than the perfect Southern Belle. And uh, she was written about in the Richmond Papers as being tawny. And um, so when it's time for her to go to New York and she's getting all this grief and she really wants to go to New York, she writes to her daughter and says, I am free, brown, and 63. I can go wherever I want to go. <laughs> And she did, and she, she was apparently quite a conversationalist. And so in addition to her writings, um, which she did do, she wrote for the world and she wrote a couple of novels, uh, she uh, really ran a salon. And uh, everybody would go to see her and, and be charmed by her. Uh, and she made a point of befriending Julia Grant. Now this was front page news in every newspaper in the country. The First Lady of the Confederacy uh, is calling on the wife of the general who defeated the Confederacy. By this time, Grant was out of the presidency himself. And um, then she, Verena, went to the dedication of the Grant Memorial um, after he died, uh, making a point. Uh, making a point that uh, she was trying to help bring about reconciliation. And that was something that when I started writing about the Civil War um, and the women in Washington in the Civil War, I realized after the war was something that they regularly did. There were all kinds of, of uh, organizations they formed, of things they did together to try to bring the women together so that the men could get over it. And, uh, and, and some of them were things like the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They, they, that was initially meant as a, a reconciliation organization, uh, as opposed to a, you know, keeping the lost cause alive. And um, the Daughters of the American Revolution, very much formed by women uh, whose husbands had been at the top of the Union and the Confederacy. Uh, and they, again, did that to go back to an earlier time in our history when we were all together and to remind people about that. Uh, so, and, and then all kinds of social service work uh, that they did working together. Uh, so that women who uh, had really gone through some terrible uh, deprivations in the South um, during the war, then uh, got, got on their feet after the war and, uh, and did things like um, work on the yellow fever epidemic in Florida or the horrible Galveston hurricane where thousands of people were killed. 
uh, coming in to, to work to help after that. Women of South and North coming together. And you only know that by reading their letters and by seeing what they were up to. Uh, and it is, um, it is really interesting uh, work to see. Also, they became much more active politically themselves. So that someone like Virginia Clay, who had been a bill of the 50s, uh, and had ridiculed them, uh, suffragist women, uh, became an enormous suffragist herself and stood on platforms with uh, Horace Greeley uh, and Mrs. William Lloyd Garrison, people that she would have never met or talked to or had anything to do with before the war, were now her allies and she um, was a strong supporter of women's rights because of what she had experienced in her time in the war. So it was a, a, a time that uh, brought women together and brought women out from behind the curtain and onto the stage. And I see that in every war. Um, and it it's, was true with the revolution, it was true to some extent in 1812, certainly with the Civil War. Uh, right now I'm writing a book about uh, suffrage geared to the 100th anniversary and uh, World War I was incredibly important there. And of course you know, after World War II, um, the changes that took place. So it is a, it is a fascinating way to, to read history, uh, to write history. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it gives you a far more complete view of America. So that's why I do it, and I enjoy being able to share it with you, and I'd be delighted to take your questions. Thank you very much. What do I think about what? Litter. I still didn't get it. Litter. Litter. Trash. Litter. Litter. <laughs> I'm, I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a published reading list? Do I have a published reading list? No, but the backs of my books um, are filled with many, many, many pages of footnotes. Um, and. Uh, and bibliographies, so there's a lot in the backs of the book. So yes, that's published. Um, and I found footnotes, one of the ways that I could find women's letters was through the footnotes of biographies of men. Um, and, but that's a riot too, because you, you know, you call up, I, I, I will not name this particular historical society out of charity, um, but um, you call up and say, I see you have the papers up. Do you have his wife's papers? And they'll say, well, you know, we're still just going through his papers. Not, I'm a daily journalist. You know. It's been 200 years. <laughs> Get with it. <laughs> but there are a lot of sinecures now. Yeah. Do you see this period in, histo in history as being typical of politics, or do you think we're at a particularly volatile time? The question is, do I think this period, the one we're living through right now, is typical of American politics, or is it uh, aberrant? It's not typical, but it's not aberrant either. What's not typical is the president himself. Um, we, we've not had a president who's never served in office or the military. And, um, and it, it, it's a different approach to the presidency, uh, clearly. Um, but what isn't different is the animus uh, among the, between the parties. And it's worse than it usually is. Um, and it, it's poisonous and personal in ways that uh, we haven't seen since the lead up to the Civil War, when it was like that and everybody was armed. Um, that's another thing Abigail Brooks Adams wrote about. The other side, hands go to their breast at the least provocation. And they did shoot each other, which they don't do now. Um, <laughs> um, metal detectors, good. But, um, but, and they shot each other all the time. I mean, it wasn't just Burr Hamilton. There was a dueling ground right outside of Washington in Bladensburg where um, they would, the term of art was to call you out. They'd call each other out 
on the floor of the house, and then they'd go shoot each other. And, um, as, and by the way, Burr Hamilton, think about it, the sitting vice president of the United States murdered his political enemy over political speech. Now, we've had a recent vice president with a problem with a gun, but as far as I know, it wasn't. <laughs> so, if there have been worse times, um, and uh, they clearly um, led to disastrous results, and that's the concern. I mean, the period before the Civil War was worse, but then we had a Civil War where 600,000 Americans were killed. No, so we don't want to repeat that. And thank the Lord, there is no um, overriding moral issue like slavery. There can't be an issue like slavery. There you can't be anything that's the equivalent of, of keeping human beings in bondage. But, um, but it, is, it is a very uh, poisonous and dangerous time. And I do think that uh, we have to pay attention to that. Yeah. <laughs> Question is, Mary Todd Lincoln, have I studied her and the reason she was put away? She was put away by her son. Yes. And she was, she was gotten out, she was sprung by a, a woman lawyer. Um, no, but she, she was crazy, I think, you know. She was, she was difficult uh, in every way. And, um, and she clearly had obsessions. I mean, she, she shopped you know, one day buying like 300 pairs of gloves. And, and everything she did was recorded by the press. I mean, she'd go around New York with the troops of reporters following her, so you'd think she'd sort of catch on. Um, but, um, and it was all written about, and it was a problem for him. And then she was accused of leaking the State of the Union, and he had to go to the Hill, and he was lucky he had a Republican Congress, and he had to go to the Hill and basically say, you know, don't, don't uh, bring my wife up here. It would be way too embarrassing. Um, I think they actually, I think they, they had a real love affair, I think. Um, uh, and I think she was quite smart. Her political sensibilities were dead on. She understood that people were out to get him, who really were out to get him. Uh, now, I think he understood that too, but that he was trying to, you know, get everybody together. Um, I, I came away from writing, the, the, so the Civil War book is called Capital Dames, and I came away from writing that book feeling very fond of Abraham Lincoln, which I had not expected to. Uh, but his political smarts were just incredible, and how he constantly worked to keep uh, the border states in the Union, and how he understood that that's what he had to do uh, before he could move on abolition and um, and then get into the 13th Amendment. All of that, you know, because keep in mind, the Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. Um, any president could have rescinded it. So getting the 13th Amendment was everything. And um, and he, the way he plotted through that uh, was really quite, uh, quite spectacular to sort of watch in, in real time. The, the great thing now is newspapers from the 18th century on are online. And you can waste days reading them. I mean, they are so much fun. Um, because all the ads are there, everything, you know, all the performances, everything's there. Um, and so, I, you know, you feel like you're kind of learning it in real time as you're reading the papers. Um, but she, after he died, she took to her bed for six weeks. People came in and plundered the White House. Um, she finally went to Illinois with her best friend, who was the formerly enslaved dressmaker, Elizabeth Keckley. And Elizabeth Keckley is described as a dressmaker, but she was much more than that. She was a couturier. She, had, she was a designer. She had a shop with lots of people working for her. And um, she went with Mrs. Lincoln to uh, Illinois. Then Mary couldn't pay her, and, and Mrs. Keckley had a business to get back to. She then did go back. She then wrote a tell-all uh, about uh, the Lincolns uh, behind the scenes in the White House and included a lot of Mary Lincoln's letters. And so um, the friendship ended 
and, um, and actually killed Mrs. Keckley's business because other people were worried she might write about them. And, um, and the African American community felt she was a disloyal to them, which she didn't mean to be. Uh, she meant it to be sort of protecting Mary, but that's not how Mary's own words came across. And so she did a bunch of things in there. She tried to sell her clothes. She tried to do a bunch of things. And, and at that point, her son got her committed. But she got out and then went to Europe and stayed there for a while. And then when her younger son died, that was really kind of it. Yes? Did, have you observed differences in the women connected with World War One? as opposed to the earlier? Have I observed differences in the women connected to World War I as opposed to the earlier? Well, the main difference is, is that they had many more opportunities, uh, even though it was still the early 20th century. They were uh, officially enlisted into all kinds of wartime activities. Um, there's a wonderful book that came out this year that I highly recommend called Hello Girls, uh, which is about the Signal Corps telephone operators of World War One, and they were at the front, um, and their stories are, are really quite remarkable. Um, and but there were women uh, in the Signal Corps. There were, you know, there were of course all the Red Cross uh, operations. Something like 20 million people joined the Red Cross during the war. Um, they raised 400 million dollars. Uh, but there were also all kinds of uh, auxiliary things. So there were. There was the farmerettes, <laughs> uh, women uh, called upon to work on the farms. And a lot of these were college-educated women. Um, and so there, were, there was a lot more specific activity calling on women to uh, participate in the war effort, which then gave them the ability to say to the Congress, and especially to Woodrow Wilson, also not my favorite, um, to say, you know, we've done all of this for the war. We deserve the vote. Yes. Are there present day women that you'd like to read their correspondence? Are there present day women where I'd like to read their correspondence? Well, unfortunately, they don't correspond. Um, <laughs> Now, they probably have some emails that would be fun to read. Um, but, um, and I do recommend to people, you know, because I'm asked this all the time, what are we going to do without letters? And even when we have letters, children aren't being taught cursive. And um, reading the letters is not easy. And so, you know, there's, there's going to be a challenge ahead. Uh, but one of the things I do recommend is uh, do print out your emails from the family because even though they're not beautifully written and lengthy and all of that, they tell a story. Um, they, they're often written around weddings and around deaths and uh, around times when families are going through something uh, that is no, noteworthy. And uh, if, you, if you print those out, you will have something of a story. And you know, they do, I mean, even if they're short, they tell you something. I'm one of, uh, when Steve and I wrote the marriage book, I did a chapter on pioneer marriages. And um, when the women went west, they understood they were doing something extraordinary. Um, it was so hard. And they, um, they wrote journals or they wrote letters home or whatever. And one woman, Mary Walker, had gone all the way to Oregon to work in a mission with her husband. And this was 1814 in there. And uh, from Maine to, right, I know. And you know, you, they're getting pregnant on the way, losing babies, it's hard. And um, she wrote uh, home, she wrote sort of a journal by way of letters home. And she wrote one day, it was up at five, baked nine loaves of bread, uh, taught school, uh, was delivered of a son. <laughs> now, that's a tweet, you know. <laughs> but you get the picture. <laughs> so, the other thing, the one other thing I'll say about preserving memory, um, you've probably heard on NPR StoryCorps. And these are oral histories done all over the country, uh, preserved at the Library of Congress. There are now millions of them. 
And uh, Thanksgiving week, there is an effort every Thanksgiving week to have grandchildren interview their grandparents. And, um, and that is a treasure trove. Uh, you have that, you know, by the way, in Georgetown County, you've done a wonderful job of oral history. And um, there's really much more of it here than in most places. And they're in the libraries. Um, so it's, it's a really great resource that's here in Georgetown County. Is any effort being made to take any part of what you spoke about to get it into a school curriculum? Question is, is there any effort being made to take any part of what I spoke about and get it into a school curriculum? We need to get history, period, into school curriculum. Um, it's a real problem, and it's something I really would uh, commend to you to... Um, to work on because it is something that there are various organizations doing some great work on, particularly in the South. Um, let me just, I, I have some numbers here. Um, our civic and historical ignorance is horrible. And um, the uh, fact is that the reason, part of the reason for that, is because we don't teach in the schools. So um, here's civic participation. 48% of adults directly take part in a civic group or activity. 48, so fewer than half. 35% have worked to solve community problems. 22% have gone to a political meeting, 13% are in a group that tries to influence the government. Um, you know, 6% have gone to an organized protest. Then we ask knowledge. Do you know anything about free speech of the First Amendment? Most of the country does, 86%. Um, do you know about the Electoral College? Two thirds, or three fourths do that. 22nd Amendment, which is, you know, you two terms for president. Then you now made down to 56%. The vice president breaks ties in the Senate, 54%. Takes 60 votes to break a filibuster, um, 41%. So, you know, you've got some knowledge, but uh, that's, that's the whole population. That's not kids. And uh, when you get into what kids know, it's, you know, that many more of them have heard of Judge Judy than have heard of Judge Justice Roberts. And, uh, and we vote for her. And um, uh, so, um, to me, the answer is to get history and civics education back in the schools. And the reason it's not in the schools is because it's not on the test. It's not on the assessment test. And because teachers teach to the test, which I'm not blaming them for, that's, you know, that's kind of where it is. Um, they're not teaching history and civics. So it's my view that one of the things that we can do as citizens is lobby the state legislatures to get history and civics onto the test. Because that, that's not hard. That's not a hard thing to do. Yes? Who's the author of Hello, Girls? Uh, who's the author of Hello, Girls? It's a woman named Elizabeth Cobbs. <laughs> Asking memory questions. Young and Young and old, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, it's wonderful. Well, it's great to be here. Um, given your uh, love for our history as a country, and recognizing the political uh, fights we've gone through over centuries. Are there lessons from the recovery period of those fights which can be applied to today? The question is um, looking at history and seeing the times throughout our history that we've had these fights are the lessons from the recovery periods. Um, so as I said earlier, there are lessons that the women tried to teach of coming together. The period that I grew up in was very much a recovery period after World War II. And that, I've come to believe, was the aberrant period. But it was, it was certainly nice. Um, because uh, there, was, um, there was a sense of, uh, that we were all in it together. The whole country had gone to war. 
uh, and everybody had sacrificed. There was rationing, all of that. The Congress was made up of veterans. Uh, there was an enormous congressional Republican class of 1946, and then an enormous Democratic class of 1948. And they had all gone to war. And they had literally been in the trenches together. And so they did not see the guy across the aisle as the enemy. They saw him as the opposition, but they didn't think he was evil or had evil intent. The enemy was the dictator across the sea. And that really lasted uh, through a lot of the Cold War period, um, really up until Vietnam, and even after Vietnam, because there were still so many World War II veterans still in Congress. In fact, the last one left in the last Congress. Um, so, and that made an enormous difference. Um, when I was growing up, my father was a um, Democratic congressman from Louisiana. One of my best friends, father was a Republican congressman from New York. Uh, he went on to be Barry, he was the chairman of the Republican National Committee, Barry Goldwater's running mate. My father went on to become majority leader of the House. The friendship was um, so close, we're still quite close friends. Uh, and uh, that was normal because we all grew up together, we all knew each other. And it's very hard to demonize someone whose child is playing Clue in your basement, you know. And, uh, and that really was the case. And um, uh, my last interview with Jerry Ford, uh, he said to me, Koki, I just don't understand what's going on in Washington. And that was before it was anywhere near as bad as it is now. And he said, you know, when I was minority leader and your dad was majority leader, uh, we would get in a cab together and go downtown and say to each other, all right, what are we going to argue about? And he said, it was a genuine argument. It was a legitimate debate. We did disagree about means to an end, but, and it was partisan for God's sake. We were the leaders of our parties in the House of Representatives. But then we'd get back in the cab and be best friends. And that was really true. Um, today is actually the anniversary of the day my father disappeared in a plane in Alaska. And Jerry Ford was at our house every night. Well, it has been lovely. One more. I think it's rounding on 11 o'clock, but it's um, it's really been a treat to be with you. I'm, uh, I love being part of this community. It is a wonderful, wonderful community. I'm sorry it keeps flooding, uh, but um, but it really is um, a special a special place and a place that Steve and I both and Steve will be tonight at 5:30 at the museum on Broad Street, so you can have stereo records. Um, but uh, we really do feel strongly that it's a community we, we, we treasure being part of and want to contribute to. So thank you very much for giving me that opportunity. <laughs>